If you want Colts talk all year long, you're in the right place. Fires upfield into the end zone, and it's caught. Jelani Woods, touchdown. He's going to fire upfield. It's broken up, tip, and intercepted by the Colts. This is the official Colts podcast, giving you an updated look at what's new with the horseshoes. Colts have it. Interception. Two seconds left, and the Colts are going to win. In the Indiana Union Construction Industry Radio Studio, let's get the podcast started. Man, everybody is mad at Taylor Swift. Like, everybody <laughs> oh, where are we going is here? mad at her. Well, I shouldn't say that. Either you love her or you're just like, I just want to watch football. Yeah, that's a good point. Yeah. <laughs> just want to watch football. <laughs> Bill, I don't know if you knew this, but Travis Kelsey is dating Taylor Swift. <laughs> what? Yeah, I really? didn't know if you had saw that yet. Uh, you wow. know what? Uh, this that is breaking is a shock yes, news. I, I know we are that, breaking news here. <laughs> yes, this you is can go back and crawl under that rock in which you live <laughs> under. But uh, that's just it. I mean, I've never seen anybody take over the world faster oh. than uh, than Taylor Swift. What is your favorite Taylor Swift song, by the way? Uh, to be honest with you, don't know any of them. Really? Really? I'm not Taylor. This Casey, listen, they have changed. List. Major League Baseball teams change start times to games to accommodate Taylor Swift concerts. Really? Yeah. Yeah, like the Cincinnati Reds bumped up the start time to a game on a Friday night to like 5-10. Like that, the pivotal marquee 5-10 <laughs> game start time. That's just perfect for everybody really? on Friday. Because she because was in town she was in playing town? a concert at 8 o'clock later that night. How about that? Yeah. I know the St. Louis, uh, maybe the, uh, one other team did that. I'm not Jeez. sure. But yeah. I mean, the Swifties and all. I mean, I get it. Like We yeah. are never getting back together. <laughs> Casey Bell, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, there's that one. There's Shake It Off. I, mean, I stay out too late. Okay, She's there's a whole okay. bunch. Yeah, I mean, Shake It Off. You know, okay, I, I, I have, know that one. I yes. have a little bit of country music past. I used to work in country radio, there so there are a handful, so I understand it. All right, we are, uh, we are not going to talk about that the rest of the show. We are talking <laughs> and previewing the Colts and the Tennessee Titans coming up on Sunday. Boys, this is a monster game for the Indianapolis Colts coming back inside the AFC South. The third divisional test in the first five games for the Colts. Meanwhile, for Tennessee, this is their first division game. Explain that to me, NFL. Okay, I know every <laughs> team is dealing with with uh, schedule inequities, but explain that to me, just well, like the case last year for the Colts. That, that's what I was about to say. I mean, it seems like this is becoming a trend for the Colts is let's get a bunch of them out of the way early. And, I mean, you know, I'm not, not one to play, you know, that woe is us, but it's almost like – it takes you a little while to kind of get, get into going. a rhythm and a yes. groove, and it just kind of throws you out of sync when you get them all out there early. But here's a really good test for the Colts. Sure. You have to deal with it because that's what the right. NFL says. You have yeah, to play the schedule that game. is what the it schedule is. Schedule is what yep. it is. So <laughs> my thing is though, I would like to see it spread out at least yep. a little bit more over the whole season. Yeah, that's what Tennessee's saying to themselves right now, <laughs> after uh, you know trying to figure some things out. Right, right. Who are the Tennessee Titans? We're talking Sunday storylines going into this game number five. That's a huge one. Who are the Tennessee Titans? Will the t- will the real Titans please stand up? Because I have no idea. Hey, that's what Eminem. Sense. I know that. There you go. Yeah. You can get Taylor Swift. There you go. Eminem, you got it. All right, here we go. The Titans. They beat the Bengals. 27-3 to three last week. Maybe the best performance under Mike Vrabel since he's been there in yeah. terms of just total domination, yards, uh, not giving any anything to the opponent in terms of breathing life to Cincinnati last week. Uh, the week before that, though, they were drubbed by the exact same score, 27-3, uh, to the Cleveland Browns. So they're two at home, Billy, 2-0 and oh at home, I should yep. say, 0-2 oh on the road. They have not yet scored a touchdown on the road in their two losses. And their two wins, averaging 27 points per game, and two losses, putting up only nine points per game. Uh, you can go on and on here. Just the, the splits are just remarkable in terms of when they're good, they're good. When they're bad, they look really, really bad, <laughs> Billy. Right. You've been on some teams that you know have, have – <laughs> Had a hard time kind of finding their identity early in the season. Tennessee, had, did they find their identity last week? And, and what do you make of the Titans going into this game, game number five? Yeah, they've been up and down. You know, as you said, you chronicled it very well that on the road they haven't been playing well. But at yeah. home they play pretty good. You know, they, they run the ball seems like a little bit better when they're at home. Uh, I think they're averaging about 157 yards at home when they're rushing the ball. And I think that's the Tennessee Titans that I'm expecting to see, the Tennessee Titans that can run the ball. That's what they want to do. They want to play physical. They want to beat you up and kind of kind of, kind of control the clock. And if they can control the clock and, of course, get ahead of you, 
kind of put pressure on you to try to hurry up and get back and then make mistakes. Yeah, I mean, that's. Uh, I don't think anybody knows who the Titans <laughs> are. I mean, it, it, it's, it's really, you talk about Jekyll and Hyde, and that, that is what we have seen, and it's, it's rather bizarre, truly. The only concerning thing is, is that I think they may have found themselves No, that's last a good week. point. I think yeah. last week, but, but, I, but I, you say that coming off of a game the week prior where it looked like, wow, th- this might be the end of an era of a Titans team that we had seen for so long be so consistent and always in the games. Two weeks ago, we didn't say that about the Titans. Then last week, he got right. back to it. So it's one of those things where the performance you saw last week, if they can continue rolling that way, then you get back to, okay, this is a typical Mike Vrabel Titans team. But right now, the inconsistency makes it so hard to really pinpoint on who this Titans team is. Yeah, and I, I really encourage everybody. I mean, on a weekly basis, there's no doubt. But especially this week, if you have a chance and you love football, you love X's and O's, and you want to figure out why – one team is playing well or why one team dominated the other, I, I encourage you really listen to Inside Football with Rick Venturi this week. Yeah. I mean, we had about a 48-minute discussion <laughs> on the Tennessee Titans, the blueprints for the Colts to beat Tennessee. But to steal a line from him, and he's so right about this, it's all about advantage for Tennessee. Yep. When they are in advantage, yep. and what I mean by that is when they get off to a fast start, when they can dictate the the physicality of the game to another team, when they can stay on schedule in terms of down and distance, when they can establish the running game with Derrick Henry, right? When they can afford to give him 20, 25 carries per game and you know, let him run downhill, that's when the Tennessee Titans, that's when they're at their best, and that was on full display last Sunday against Tennessee. They just dominated that game. Yeah, they, they, they love to run the ball. That's what they want to do. That's, they have Derrick Henry, you know, one of the best backs in the National Football League, so they're going to continue to run the ball. And if they get him going and he can get his shoulders going north and south, mm-hmm. he's very tough to bring down. So that's what they want to do. They want to establish the run and play physical. They want to play physical football, and that's who they are. And they want to put Ryan Tannehill in good situations. Right. I'm not – I'm not taking anything away from his ability to potentially, you know, lead a comeback or throw the ball 40 times per game, but they honestly go as he goes. And I mean that as a compliment when, again, when they can dictate things and play from advantage, Ryan Tannehill is a really good quarterback because he makes really good decisions. He's very accurate. I mean, so far this year, his splits, just like the rest of the team, wins versus losses are crazy. Uh, And two losses – 49% 49% completion percentage and two wins 77.6 <laughs> all right so I mean obviously he's a really good quarterback but he's a really good quarterback when things are going well and when he doesn't have to shoulder a lot of that responsibility because of their identity in terms of who they have been since 2019 running the ball being really good on play action being really good in the red zone yep. and letting the the run game open up the pass for the Tennessee Titans. That's so, that's such a good point because that is that's, that's the reason that that I know that's why I said it. But I mean that is Ryan Tannehill in a nutshell. Such a if jerk you comment. if you look at at the way that he has been the quarterback for the Titans and why the success is there it's because when Ryan Tannehill is not asked to do too much that is when you see the Titans playing to the top of their ability. Now, Ryan Tannehill, everybody has, it seems like everybody has their opinions of Ryan Tannehill and no one's going to put him in there as like a top 10 quarterback. But when the Titans are rolling, you cannot discredit how good of a quarterback Ryan Tannehill is. You know about Derrick Henry. They add DeAndre Hopkins. Those guys are just dynamic weapons. Defensively, this Titans team is, they are elite. Yeah. They they have guys all over the defensive backfield that, that is very, very difficult. But when Ryan Tannehill can just kind of stay within the lane, that's where you get really – it make, it makes things difficult because you mentioned play action, you mentioned red zone. Yeah. He's so good in and those instances, so you can it, it makes it difficult for sure. throw the ball between the numbers. numbers. Right? Yep. He doesn't have to push the ball right. outside, uh, push the ball down the field and width-wise outside the numbers because of that running game opening up the pass, and he's a really good deceptive running quarterback as well. He can scramble out of the pocket. Now, he's not look to, looking to create his own, no. but he is very, very good at scrambling and just getting those back-breaking first-down conversions by being a good athlete and a rushing quarterback. All right, let's stay in-house. A Sunday storyline for this game uh, for the Colts going into it, Jonathan Taylor. All right, 
Jonathan Taylor, as we sit here and talk right now, we're taping this on Thursday morning. Jonathan Taylor is scheduled to meet with the media later on today on this Thursday. So obviously we're not going to have any reactions to to his comments, really speaking for right. the first time since – when May since June, yeah, yeah, yeah June. Yeah. It would have been June yeah. during yeah. during yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah during OTAs, OTAs. And, and mini camp. Yeah. So he is back on the practice field this week. That has opened up the 21 day window for he and the Colts coming off of PUP. There is a chance. All right, there is a chance that he plays on Sunday against the Tennessee Titans. And if he does play, we don't know what that's going to look like in terms of pitch count or workload or, or things like that as he gets back into, um, you know, gets up to, to speed with, with Anthony Richardson in this offense with uh, Shane Steichen. But we do know, right, the last time he was fully healthy in 2021, rushing champ in, in the NFL, broke a franchise record, 1,800 yards, all those touchdowns. Bill, let's keep it simple. When he does come back on the field, and again, we don't know if that's going to be this Sunday or not, when he does get back on the field, what is the ceiling for this backfield with he and wow. Anthony Richardson? I think <laughs> the ceiling is very high with, with these two back there, of course, JT and Anthony Richardson being back there, and also you know having Zach Moss to come in for relief at times. So I think it's very high because the defense is going to have to say, hey, look, who do we want to stop? Do we want to stop JT mm -hmm. between the tackles, so to speak, or do we want to stop Anthony Richardson running out wide? To me, I think that's a good thing for the Colts. So that's two weapons that they have that the defense has to make sure they account for. And if they can't account for those guys, we'll run the ball very successfully. Mm -hmm. But then also there's the passing game. Yep. You know, these guys are going to say, okay, we're going to bring somebody down to the box. We're going to have eight people in the box to stop the run. That's going to open up for the passing game. So having JT back, don't know how he's going to be when he first gets back because he's not in football shape. I don't think he's in football shape. He's probably in great shape just right. running and, and conditioning but not football shape. So that yeah. might take a little while for him to get up to speed. But once I think he gets up to speed, I think it's going to be a very, very powerful – it could be a very, very powerful offense. I mean, this is one of the things we talked about when the Anthony Richardson was drafted is, wow, you look at the two guys in the backfield and what that will do for opposing defenses. So now seeing that, you know, get that start to come to fruition, it's going to be something exciting to watch because ultimately both these guys are game breakers. Both yes. these guys have the ability to change the game on, on one touch of the football. Mm -hmm. So – the ceiling, that's your ceiling. I mean, you have – what it does is it adds not only a playmaker. I mean, you're adding a guy who can break the game wide open anytime he touches the football. So it's going to, it's going to be very interesting to see how defenses start to play the Colts' offense because it's going to look a lot different from what we've seen the first four weeks, in my opinion. I'm just so excited about the big play ability and yeah. potential from both of those guys. I mean, some of these – numbers on Jonathan Taylor coming back. I mean, if you look at his runs over 10 yards for his career, 17.9% of his overall career carries are going over 10 yards. All right, that's insane. And then you look at what Anthony Richardson has been able to produce so far in terms of, of his big play ability. All right, he's got eight passes over 20 on the season and four runs over 12. So 12.6% 12 of his touches if you will are big plays so I'm just really excited for what are you going to do are you going to crowd the box all right now now that's more opportunities right. to push the ball down the field yep. outside yep. the numbers yep. which the Colts proved they could do last week they had three completions over 30 so it's good that that component of the offense showed up uh, in the second half against the Rams but if you're going to just play the Colts straight up and you're going to respect the pass and the run and you don't have eight nine guys in the box Good luck with Jonathan Taylor <laughs> and Anthony Richardson. Yeah, it, it, one way that, and this is very basic, but it's going to keep the defenses honest. And yes, that's, right. that is the key. I mean, we have seen what Shane Steichen and this offense can do. I mean, clearly to, the, to this point, he has done some things that I don't think a lot of people thought this offense was capable of doing. So you add another wrinkle and you make defenses play a little bit more of, a, of the natural way. I kind of like what this is going to look like. When you can dictate to the defense the way that you want them to play, you have them in, on, right. in your palm of your hand. You right. can do what yeah. you want, and you can set the plays that you want and say, hey, look, we're going to set this play up so when we get down here in the plus plus uh, area, we're going to score a touchdown with this yeah. play because I know this is the way they're going to play against us. And speaking of big plays, Mo Ali cox had a really big play for a touchdown, a 35-yard catch, his first touchdown in 2023. Big Mo is going to join us here in the podcast in just a few minutes. Before we do that, though, I quickly want to go into – 
Um, another Sunday storyline. How about the passing game or the passing defense for the Colts? The Colts are giving up 7.6 yards per attempt. They rank 28th in the NFL in passing yards allowed so far in the season. They've given up three really big games to opposing wide receivers, right? The Nico Collins game, the Kelvin Ridley game, yep. and then Puka Nakua just went off yep. on the Colts. And it wasn't just the, their overall number of yards. It was the timely catches. catches. It was the overtime catch for 20-plus to set up the Rams on that drive in overtime. And then obviously, you know, the Colts got all out of sorts in the secondary, losing track of where the top receiver was for the Rams on that 22-yard catch for a touchdown in overtime. Uh, but, but, Bill, the Colts have allowed 195 receiving yards per game to opposing wide receivers on the season. And another storyline is that you know you got Dallas Flowers now down, right? Yes. Your top one of your top cornerbacks is is out for the season, a torn Achilles. So it's either going to be Daryl Baker Jr. back in the lineup after being inactive in each of the last two games, or it's Jalen Jones making his NFL debut in terms of being a starting cornerback yep. in a really big game for the Colts inside the division coming up on Sunday. Where are you on the passing defense so far uh, going into this game when they're going to have to stop the run and the pass? We just chronicled it with uh, Ryan Tannehill. Yeah, you know, Ryan Tannehill, if you right. mentioned earlier, is good in play action pass. And if they get the running game going, the play action pass. So for us, for the secondary, it's going to be very important for the for the secondary to play a little tighter if they can because DeAndre Hopkins is, is very good, someone they can get the ball down the field to. Uh, Westbrook Akini is, is very good. He's been playing very well. So it's going to be imperative of the Colts to stay close to those guys because you don't want to give those big explosive plays against the, the Tennessee Titans. That's what they're trying to get. They're trying to lull you to sleep with the run, 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 beat you up, then go over the top. So I think it's something that they're going to have to tighten up their coverage definitely and do something a little bit different. And hopefully they can maybe make him one-dimensional. Then that way you make Tannehill one-dimensional. And that way you can, hey, maybe set your defense and say, hey, we know they're going to pass. We're going to put them in third and long if you can. Do be successful on first and second down. And that might play into your hands as far as the defense is concerned for the Indianapolis Colts. But, Casey, this could be the third consecutive week the Colts have a rookie making his first start in the NFL. Two weeks ago, Juju Brents. Yep. Last week, Blake Freeland, and now potentially Jalen Jones. Yeah, I mean, and you go even further than that. I mean, I know he wasn't a rookie, but Daryl Baker Jr. started week one. That was his debut. I know right. he, he was a practice squad guy the entire, you know, 2022 campaign. So yeah. Still was, a young guy. So if you look at it, I mean, right. almost right. every week they've kind of had somebody making their debut. And, and I know this is kind of a cop-out answer, but this is why up front it is so imperative to kind of own the line of scrimmage for the defensive front because – as Bill mentioned, getting them behind the st behind the chains, making it third and long, it it will help out that young secondary. But and the pass rush too. Yes, yeah, without exactly. Quiddy Pay, without Quiddy, that's another yeah, story. Potentially yeah, exactly. without Quiddy Pay. Yeah, I mean, exactly. Dio had a great game last week. We right. saw we saw a very played good, very well. But I mean, Quiddy Pay was for the. I mean, he was there the entire. So it, it is going to be you know a lot of next man up mentality, and this is one of the things we talked about going into the season. Very young secondary gets tested. Definitely, for sure, on Sunday. I'll be anxious to kind of see how it looks. I do like the fact that, you know, with Juju and Daryl, if, if those a couple guys that are taking a lot of snaps, we do at least have them some starting reps that it's not just yeah. a handful of guys in by fire right now. But definitely, I mean, Jalen Jones is going to be called upon. It, it's yeah. for sure going to be called upon. He's so have to play. Some guys are going to step up for sure. And he had a really good camp. He had a really yeah. good preseason, both on defense, earning the trust of Ron Miles yep. and Gus Bradley. And playing so well as a seventh round draft pick, you know, he's kind of in the mix of, of all of those cornerbacks the Colts drafted back in April, the three of them. But he played so well that they couldn't not give him a roster right. spot over yep. Darius Rush, who they drafted in the fifth round and ended up, you know, cutting after the uh, end of the preseason there. So, you know, he earned his keep and now he gets a major opportunity uh, to at least be a big time contributor and, yep. and probably start for the Colts coming up on Sunday. We'll keep an eye on that. Our last Sunday storyline before we talked to Mo Ali Cox, we talked about it, slowing down Derrick Henry, all right? Since, tw uh, since 2018, the Colts defense has allowed a 100-yard rusher nine times, which is really good, right? That's the third fewest over that time frame. But Derrick Henry has accounted for six <laughs> of those games. Wow. All right, Henry has seven career 100-yard rushing games against the Colts, which is the most – by any player against any opponent 
since he entered the NFL in 2016. Jeez. He's been over 100 yards in six of the last seven games against the Indianapolis Colts. Now, I will give the Colts credit. Anytime a running back like Derrick Henry is going to get 20, 25 carries right. per game, the cumulative effect takes over, all right? Yes. So you can live with, you know, 25 carries for – a buck fifteen, as long as that yards per carry is around. Yeah, no, no, no huge explosive right. ones inside. Right, yeah. exactly. Twenty-five yard gains or the, the right. sixty-yard dagger yep. uh, in the fourth quarter that that really sinks you. Um, but that being said, the Colts last week, Bill, they played most of that game without DeForest Buckner. He was on a pitch count. Uh, with that groin injury. Now he's back on the injury report this week with a back. As we sit here and tape this right now on Wednesday, he did not practice because the Colts held a walkthrough. Right. They did not practice on Wednesday because they're trying to save some legs and stay fresh after back-to-back -back weeks playing in overtime. But that was concerning because the last two games, the Colts defense has given up on average 175 rushing yards to the Ravens and the Rams, and the Rams really not known for their right. rushing ability. No. How worried are you guys about this game with the Colts' ability to slow down the rush with the best rusher coming to town? It's kind of twofold in my eyes because I, I think it's one of those things you, you kind of laid it out well with Derrick Henry. He's going to get a handful of carries. You know what's going to happen. And there, are, I remember there are a handful of times you look at the Colts' box score at the end, and it's Derrick, Derrick Henry, 28 carries for a 110 yards, and his yards per carry, maybe 3.5. And you're like, that's yeah. what you want. So I think ultimately, I'm not as much worried in that sense of the yardage. I, I Mainly, I am all about making sure the guys are run discipline. You know, making sure that you're taking good angles. You're not allowing him to, you know, so I feel like, the la I think it was last year, there were two runs where he broke out and both times it was based on just bad angles that a defensive back took, and it allowed him to get to the edge. So I think just making sure you run discipline on Derrick Henry, keep him in front of him, make sure you're tackling him with all i mean, all the fundamentals of tackling because he breaks the mold. I mean, this guy, he looks like a, a defensive end, and he's running the football. So it's he, he breaks the mold of what you can do as far as arm tackling. You have to be disciplined in all of the fundamentals, and, and that is so key against Derrick Henry. But I don't know, I, I just have a feeling that this team, the last two weeks, has heard all the noise about we pride ourselves on stopping the run and they haven't done it. And I just I think that these they're they're they look up to a game like this where okay, Derrick Henry, we have seen what you can do. We're gonna keep you in. And I think it's I, I like the Colts in this game as far as the run defense goes. Well, I think the Colts defenses want the challenge because right. the Colts want to play physical football themselves from the defensive standpoint and then Tennessee's going to bring that from an offensive standpoint with Derrick Henry running the ball. So I, I think they are they want the challenge, and then of course I think they're up to the challenge. But they're going to have to be disciplined, as you said, Casey. I think they have to be disciplined. Don't let this guy get up the field. Don't let the let him be one on one with somebody. Gang tackle him. You have to gang tackle him. Everyone has to run to the ball and make sure they get to him so they can tackle him and bring him down. One person is, is not going to bring him down. He's a too big of a running right. back, too powerful of a running back to have one person bring down. Yes, someone can, one person can bring him down, but for the most part, mm -hmm. you need to gang tackle this man. And if you could do that and keep them, as we said earlier, third and long, make them uh, you know, go the long way to get a first down, I think that will help the coach. But I am concerned. Anytime you have Derrick Henry back right. there running the ball, He I'm adds concerned. concern for yes. sure. Oh, for yeah, everybody. 100%. It's not yeah. just for the Colts. It's for every other <laughs> right. team in the National Football mm -hmm. League. This is just an identity game. You know, the Tennessee Titans have an identity. Right. They've got a brand of football. We just talked about it. Playing from advantage, being good on first and second down, being good in the red zone, play action passing, running the ball. It's all about – physicality yes. under Mike Vrabel, all right? They have the best division record in the AFC South since 2018 when he took over as the head coach. It's just an identity game. Who wants it more? These two teams, I don't want to say they know each other very well because that's a cliched you know, response, <laughs> right. it, but it's also not it, all that true because of Shane Steichen. Steichen. Right. Exactly. It's, new, yeah. you know, it's his offense. first venture against Tennessee. But the point is the Colts know – who the Tennessee Titans are. And they know this game's going to come down to the fourth quarter like it always does against the Tennessee Titans. And it's just about execution. Right. It's just about physicality. And I think this is going to be the most physical game, one of the most physical games the Colts play 
all year long. It's a home game. We know about all the streaks. We'll talk about that in just a second. But I just think this is an identity game. Who are you? You know who they are. Can can the Colts finally out Titan the Titans <laughs> and and stop Derrick Henry? I think that it kind of all boils down to that. Speaking of physicality, Mo Alley Cox, Big man. one catch. For 35 yards, and you want to talk about physicality. <laughs> yeah. Running Bully over. Running, over. <laughs> Ram running on people yards over. Yards after the catch, <laughs> taking people on rides across the goal line. <laughs> Big Mo joined myself and Bill Brooks earlier today to talk about that catch and his season so far in 2023. All right, we are joined in studio now by Colts tight end Mo Alley Cox, who is fresh off his first touchdown in 2023 against the Los Angeles Rams. Big Mo, what's going on, man? Thanks for the time. Yes, sir, no problem. How you been, man? I've been good. Yeah? Know, just grinding. Just, you know, we're in season mode, so just back in that routine. There's no doubt about that. It, it's, a, it's an absolute daily grind. And as I said, the setup there, your first touchdown in 2023, a 35-yard gain. Tell us about that play because it was kind of a – you know, off script play, if you will, from Anthony Richardson. Uh, How did you find yourself so open for it that? It was just uh, off comeback? script in general because <laughs> I hadn't repped that play all week. Like, Colin repped it every time. Like, really? pretty much, like, we have personnel set 11 Granson. Yep. But, we, you know, we go a lot of no, no huddle. So I was just in on a play. And I'm really supposed to, like, clear it out for Alec. Yeah. Grab a safety, but they came out in a completely different coverage than we expected. So. Once I saw the coverage and I ran it, I was like, oh, I'm, I'm most likely getting the ball. <laughs> so I came on my break. It wasn't there. I saw Anthony was under pressure. I'm like, if I keep going across, I saw all the open field over there. So I just kept going, and he launched it. And I knew I was so wide open. Like, I kind of turned my head before I caught it. I bobbled Ooh. it a little bit. Yeah. <laughs> Once I got it, I just – didn't even see the guys in front of me. I just saw blue. So that's poor guy, number two, whoever that was. <laughs> I, I, I was going to say, you, 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 you truck somebody out yeah, there. Yeah, for sure. I mean, I typically don't. If a safety okay. try, if a safety try to attack me one on one, yeah, up high, it's not going to be. A yeah, good, so, it's not a pretty sight. So ninety seven, Michael Hoyt. Yeah. I, I don't know. I don't know what you charged him for that ride <laughs> across the goal line, but he got a free ride with you. And then you also dropped off number two, Russ Yeast, a local product from Center Grove High School. You dropped him off at the bus stop around the five-yard yeah, line. Sure. I he didn't wanted even, nothing to do with I didn't you. even know he was playing in his hometown. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry, Sorry to your family that had to see that, man. <laughs> it was a fan. Now, you, you talk about – uh, how you didn't rep that play. Yeah. Now, I know, you know, things happen throughout the course of the game. You just got to go. You got to play football. But when they called that play and you hadn't repped it, like, what was going through your mind? Um, True. Nothing really because, like, the way we rotate in the tight end room especially, it's like you'll get one series, one series, one series. So we all have to know the okay. plays. Yeah. And we during camp, that's a good thing Coach has done with us. Like, Or even in walkthrough, we might go through it or yeah. go over it a million times. So just in case you're stuck in there on that play – you're not it's not foreign to you and different things like that so when they called it I mean I knew exactly what to do and it worked out now you mentioned the tight end room there and the tight end room is very talented here with yep. the Colts <laughs> very talented what's the atmosphere and the competition like in the in the tight end room, room because you guys are very very talented oh uh, man it's just a good group to be around like there are no egos in a room somebody does something good everybody's happy for you and we just know the workload's going to be split up some weeks and somebody might get a little bit more just depending on the flow of the game and stuff like that but I mean we're just always trying to build each other up you know I'm the veteran in the room and it's a bunch of young guys so they bring a lot of energy there and then having Tom back he he's he's a different beast in, in itself so mm -hmm. it's just um we just have a lot of good camaraderie together you know, you, you talked about the, the tight end room. You talked about Anthony Richardson making plays, and he's able to extend plays and is able to – I mean, he's just such a marvelous player outside of the pocket. Does that change your approach or your your mentality? Like, this guy – the play is never over with this guy, so I have to continuously fight to get open. Oh, yeah, for sure. Um, that's one of the first things we talked about, like, starting back in OTAs and campus. Like, you come out your break and things like that, the play is never over because – um, it's not like years past where we didn't have as, as um, a mobile of a quarterback now. Anthony, yeah. you just never know when he's going to go down. So, like, that play was just a perfect example of just continuing to fight for extra yard. Like, scramble drill was something we, like, talk about all the time. And you see it's come up a couple times in this first couple games. Sure. So. Now, you, you talked about Anthony Richardson. Now, you play with a, a number of different quarterbacks throughout yep. your career. What makes him so special? I know his physical ability as far as his size and being big and – 
being fast, but what else makes him so special out there in the football field? I think the biggest thing that I've seen is just like his poise. You okay. never really see him get rattled, especially for being a young player. Like, like no nervousness about him. He's very even keel and like something doesn't go right. He's on to the next play and different things like that. Whereas some other like younger players, I haven't really played with a young quarterback, just younger mm -hmm. players in general. Usually if something doesn't go right, yeah. you'll see it like have a cloud over their head and keep carrying on to other plays. But with him, he's just on to the next play and just mm -hmm. ready to keep going. That's Mo Ali cox with us here on the official Colts podcast, our guest this week. Bill, you said a couple quarterbacks? <laughs> yeah, well, uh, Mo, I, I was trying to be nice. Hold on. Like nine. Mo, <laughs> Mo, I know what – I well, I have the unofficial. In, in my head, I have what I think is the number. Do you know what the number is that you've played with since 2017? I want to say nine or ten. I counted 11. Starting – different starting quarterbacks. All right, well, we had Scott. Jacoby, yeah. Andrew, yep. Carson, Matt, Phillip, Brian Hoyer, Brian Hoyer, Sam Ellinger, yep. Yep. Uh, I guess Nick. <laughs> Nick Foles, yep. Anthony. And these two guys this year. Yeah, I, Anthony and Gardner. I think oh, yeah. See, I, I think, wasn't counting. I forgot about Gardner this year. Like, yeah, Gardner <laughs> this year, yeah. Yep. yeah. yeah so he 11, start, yeah. started the game in, in yep. week three against the, the Baltimore oh, wow. Ravens. That, that's got to be – that's got to be difficult on you as a pass catcher. You played in a, a, a couple of different offenses with all of these different quarterbacks. How difficult has that been over the course of time for you to get synergy and acclimation with all those different guys? Um, it's a little difficult just because of like just building the chemistry and the rapport with the quarterback. And yeah. then, you know, every quarterback wants their stuff ran a certain way, your route ran a certain way, and different things like that. So, I mean, but. But as, it's our job as players to adjust. Sure. So, I mean. Sure. You're a pro. Yeah, you just got to come job. in and get to work. Yeah. Um, a little difficult, but, I mean, it's football at the end of the but, day. But now so. that you have found stability mm -hmm. with one guy, you know, hopefully that's hopefully the case for going the forward. Yep. You know, the rest of this year and, and going forward, like you said, how much do you think that's going to help you and everybody else? Um, I, just think, I think it's just going to help us a lot because, I mean, we've never gone back-to-back -back with the same quarterback. So, yeah. I mean, you see he's already special right now and then just carry on, continue doing what he does, and then another have the season under his belt. Sure. And then hopefully in the future he's still here. You know, <laughs> I think it's going to be great things for the Colts franchise. Now you talk about different quarterbacks. Now you've played in a number of different offenses as well yep. uh, throughout your career. How do you like this offense in regards to the tight end's role in this type of offense? Oh, man, I love this offense. Um, this We have a lot of different roles, but we're used, like, in a running game, it's a little bit simpler on us, whereas before we were, like, blocking a bunch of DNs a lot. And mm -hmm. okay. that's very, like, <laughs> yeah, that's tough. <laughs> so this offense, I mean, we blocked the DN also, but we're also used on a perimeter, cornerbacks, yeah. linebackers. Okay. We're blocking more on the second level than we have in the past, which makes our job a little bit easier. Mm -hmm. So, and then in the past game, you know, that no huddle, that no huddle tempo stuff um, throws the defense off, off guard and sometimes they're not ready. Sure. So you just we're, – we're open a lot more than usual. Hey, how tough is it to be a tight end in the NFL? Oh, man, people don't understand. I like, mean, they have no idea <laughs> have how, no how idea. much you guys have on your plate. You really just got – one, it's a mental hurdle for sure because you – running game, pass game, but then sometimes you're actually a pass pro. Yeah. So you got to know all three of those and then – um and the physical. I mean, you're blocking dudes bigger than you right. that are running like 4-4, four, 4-5, four, four, defensive end and stuff like that. I mean, it's hard, but once you – if you could get like the, the mental part down, it allows you to play way faster. Yeah. And how much film do you have to watch because of all of those responsibilities? Oh, yeah, you definitely got to watch a lot of film. I try, I, try, I try to get my film in on Monday and Tuesday and then yeah. throughout the week go over practice. And, Supplement it. Yep. Yep. Now, I know you critique yourself after each game. I'm sure you critique yourself <laughs> after each practice and throughout this season. If you could say right, if you could tell us right now, what's the one thing that you would like to improve on for yourself? I mean, that you, you know, after you critique yourself after uh, a game or a practice or even during the season. I would just say continuing uh, just my pad level. Okay. And like hand placement in the run game. You know, I'm a okay. bigger guy, so just getting down there and sustaining my pad level throughout the whole play where sometimes I might get a little high. Mm -hmm. I mean, I still get the block done, but just perfecting my technique and different things like that. Okay. You know, all of these young guys in the room, Andrew Ogletree, Kylan Granson, Will Mallory. Let, let's stick with the, the real young guys, of Ogletree <laughs> and Mallory and, and Jelani Woods, right? And, you know, he's coming off of IR hopefully yeah. here soon for, for the Colts uh, dealing with that hamstring injury. What, what do you see as the potential? Because all of these guys are – they're big guys that can catch – but they all, y'all have kind of different skill sets as well. What do you see from Ogletree 
and Mallory in terms of all of the different facets they can bring to this offense? Oh, uh, well. Will definitely his speed, man. Yeah, that guy, <laughs> he is fast. Really? Yeah, okay. he could he could run. Um, I haven't seen it too much because he hasn't got too many opportunities. You know, he was hurt most of OTAs in camp. Right. I mean, he saw it a little bit in the Houston game. He got open in the open field and things mm-hmm. like that. But Will is definitely he might be the fastest out of all of us in the room. So once he he could probably speak, he could, he could play numerous positions on offense. Um, and Drew Drew does it all. Yeah. Yep. Drew could be because he's former wide receiver, so he has experience route running, different things like that. And then he's just real tough when it comes to the, the yeah. run game. Like he's not scared to throw his body around. Yeah. And do the dirty work. And you guys are so tight too. I mean, it seems like you guys genuinely have a, a great bond with one another. You know, when Mallory got his first catch in Houston. You guys were going berserk. I know Ogletree with his first <laughs> touchdown, with all that he went through last yeah, year sure. with his injury. I mean, what was that emotional um, feeling like for you to experience that with him for him? If oh you know? man, it was just exciting. I mean, we talked about we talked about it all week. We talked about it last week. Yeah, but we didn't get one. So because we knew Colin got his first one, uh-huh. and they were like, we we're like, Drew, you got to be up next. Like and then Drew <laughs> ends up getting it. And it was just like just a great moment to see just the emotion he like just the emotion he had and we were all rooting for him especially last year because he was balling and then the unfortunate injury happened so yeah. it's just happy to see him back and then Will when Will got his first catch you know Will he's a little nervous like he's always on his book that I'm like bro just relax just man you football. got it just go play <laughs> so just seeing him get a catch and just just get that one out the way see him calm down a little bit. Now, you talk about Will's first game. He's all nervous and everything. Do you remember your first game when you played in the oh, National most Football definitely. League? Uh, <laughs> Houston, Texas, at home. And they had J.J. Watt and Clowney on both sides. Oh, man. <laughs> <laughs> and I, at that oh. point, I really wasn't running any routes, so I knew I had to be blocking them the whole game. Yeah. I'm like, welcome to the NFL. Yeah, man. <laughs> what bet did you lose? Right. Oh, my stars. Well, let's talk about, you know, you talk about the Houston Texans. Let's talk about another AFC South team. Tennessee, the task at hand this week, game number five. That defense is really, really good, but they are especially against or good against the run, I should say. For sure. Why why are they such a great defense? Um, I think one, they like to set the tone with their physicality. Mm-hmm. And that starts with the guys up front. You know, you got Simmons, Landry, you got Danico, mm-hmm. who's there and um they're just they just play with a little nastiness about them. I mean, we don't like them; they don't like us. And then, <laughs> yeah, they just yeah they, they they that that front seven sets the tone for them for is, sure. Is, is this a true rivalry? I think so. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, I mean it's it's a rivalry in the sense that it's a huge division game, but for you guys trying to snap a five game losing streak to them, yep. I mean, do you guys talk about that? How much urgency is there with that um, going on this we week? We really don't talk about it too much, but we just know like. We know when we play Tennessee, we have to put the big boy pads on. Yeah. Like I was telling the guys in the room, I'm like, you guys thought Baltimore was physical. Like this is going to be yeah, just as yeah. physical, if not more physical, and stuff like that. So, um, of course, we look forward to it. Always, always um, excited to play Tennessee, but we know we got to take care of business, especially at home, which we well, haven't done in a while. Exactly. I was going to ask you that. How important is it for you and the team to get a win at home? Because they haven't won at home since almost a whole year. Yeah. I think um, since last year against Jacksonville. Um, definitely try to come out. Give our fans something to be excited about. You know, last last week we came out what zero points until midway through the third. That's right. So try mm-hmm. to get off to a faster start this week and um, just hopefully get that home one. All right. Now I do have one more question for you from me. Yep. This past spring, I heard you uh, were a commencement speaker at VCU. Yep. Uh, how was that? And what did you t- impart on the Man. young students out there at that VCU? When, graduating when they, students. When they asked me to do it, I kind of I initially said. I didn't even give an answer. I was like, man, that's kind of that's kind of a big deal. I'm like, and it's a very big so deal. I'm kind of nervous knowing that. He was like, you play in front of me? I was like, yeah, but I have a helmet on on the field. <laughs> I'm literally looking straight into a crowd of people. But um, And you're not talking either. I'm, and I'm exactly. not talking. But right. it was um, definitely a great experience. I try to leave them with gems as they embark onto that next part of their life. Like, just uh, expect the unexpected. You never know what's going to happen. Yeah. Um, control the contro- controllables because you, you can only control what you control, not the outside noise and all the other factors that might happen. And just having faith and belief in, like, what you want to do. Like, when I first got here, I didn't know, th- think I would be here for seven years. Yeah. I'm, st- I'm still here. So, just little things like that. Um, yep. It's kind of crazy because I had the teleprompter. The teleprompter went out. Oh. Oh. <laughs> it just went black. That's a kiss of death, <laughs> man. Mid speech, I'm like, whoa. Uh-oh. Now, did you but have a backup? Did luckily, back I had my paper, back, yeah. but okay. I didn't. You didn't know where you were at. I didn't, yeah, because I wasn't looking at it. Right. So I had to start flipping through it. But, you know, they love me down there in Richmond. And, like, <laughs> when I was playing basketball, like, my um, 
little slogan was most says no because I le- I was second all time in block. So yep. like the crowd started chanting it. <laughs> that's they had my back and then <laughs> oh, I found my fantastic. spot. Then I finished the speech. But it was definitely a cool experience to awesome. go back to R- City of Richmond. Oh, that's fantastic. I'm yeah. sure you killed it just like you do everything else. Yeah. Mo Alley Cox, he's a wise man right there. He's playing tight end. <laughs> we knew he was versatile. He's also given commencement speeches back at the <laughs> alma mater. Yep. Fantastic interview per usual. Mo, congratulations on that touchdown and good luck this weekend. Yes, sir. Our thanks right there to Big Mo telling us to chase our dreams as the commencement speaker at, at VCU. No, in all seriousness, he's he's uh, well suited for that job because he's a great story. I mean, guy that I mean, I tell this story all the time. I mean, he didn't even in 2017, Bill. He didn't even know how to put his his pant his uh, pads in the pants as a football player. Here he is now catching touchdown passes, twelve of them for his career for Big Mo Alley Cox. So we thank number 81 for stopping by uh, just a few minutes ago. All right, closing out here with some Titan tidbits. And this is kind of a dovetail on our Sunday storylines, just more things to focus on for the game on Sunday. Casey, how about red zone? The Colts this year have been sensational inside the red area, which is a big contrast in a good way from last year. The Colts last year just not very good. You know what it is? What's that? Our first, the first edition of the Thursday pod was coming off to the first loss, and the red zone was the problem. We yes. talked about how mm, you know, you're right? And look at that. Right. Since then, here we go. The the team has been very good in the on red zone. On fire, in fact, they have scored touchdowns on seven of their last eight red zone opportunities. Right now, the Colts rank third in the NFL in red zone percentage, seventy two percent. The Titans, by the way, on offense, they have a thirty eight point five percent red zone touchdown percentage which is 29th in the NFL. I love the way – I know we'll get into this, but I love the way Shane Steichen uh, not saves but just always has a plan for creativity, formations, and, and getting your best players the football inside the 20-yard line because that's what it all comes down to. Yep. Third down and red zone, I mean, I'm a broken record. I think football, especially in the NFL – it so much comes down to those two key areas. Bill, for you, how much of an advantage do you think the Colts have in this game because of their red zone prowess, if you will? I think that gives the Colts a big advantage um, in the red zone as if they can go out there and score some touchdowns because you want to get up on this team. You want to get up on the Titans and try to make them one-dimensional, as we talked about with Ryan Tannehill, make him do things where he's not comfortable, not his – his best suit, as uh, I would say, as mm-hmm. far as getting the ball, throwing the ball, just dropping back, throwing the ball, throwing the ball, throwing the ball. And if the Colts can get up on the Titans like that, it puts the Titans in a bad situation, I think, for the Colts to be successful in the red zone, to continue doing what they do, continue to be creative as Shane Steichen has been, and just score those touchdowns and make it very difficult for the Titans. Yeah, I mean, it's something that Matt and I have talked about leading up to this game. It's very uncharacteristic, like, the Titans to struggle inside the red zone. Yeah. That's typically an area where Ryan Tannehill thrives. He yeah. thrives in that yeah. area. So it, it's something that when I look at it, the numbers, I'm a little surprised in mm-hmm. a way. Um, but I love what you mentioned with Shane Steichen and just you know letting your your key players kind of feast, if you will, in those key and, and lining up in the inverted wishbone <laughs> and putting guys in yeah, motion. I mean, I, mean I, I just love it because you really do have to have the ball in your hands of your best players yep. inside the 20-yard line because I'm not saying it's easy to move the ball but between the 20s, but it's so much more difficult to execute when the field shrinks, shrinks yep. and the game is on the line and everybody is kind of keying on, on what your tendencies are. The Colts, I think, have just been so good in terms of – precision execution and ball handling yeah in the offensive backfield on you know if you're going to go in motion it's got to be timed up beautifully right if you're going to fake a handoff if you're going to run an rpo play all of that has to be handled very precisely with the ball handling in the backfield and the colts have done a really good job of that just flat out execution inside the 20 yard line especially when the game's on the line in the fourth quarter uh last sunday against the rams all right let's talk about streaks The Colts are playing their third AFC South game in the first five weeks. As we said, Tennessee playing their first AFC South game of the season coming up on Sunday against the Colts. The Titans have won five in a row over the Colts, which is their longest winning streak over the Colts in franchise history. That factors in the Titans era, which dates back to 1999. That's Houston Oilers days. That's everything. They've won four straight games against the Colts at Lucas Oil Stadium. The Colts have lost – seven straight games at Lucas Oil Stadium dating back 
to last year, as you talked about with Mo Ali Cox. That is the longest losing streak for the Colts at home in the history of the venue. Lucas Oil Stadium opened up in 2008. Another streak, the Titans have been horrific on the road so far this year. Yeah. They have lost five straight road games dating back to last year. Bill, I mean, I don't even know how I regurgitated all of that without all that. messing it up. <laughs> There's a lot of streaks on the line in this game. Flat out, again, I just think it, it just boils down to in this streak, in this little brother mentality that the Titans have forced upon the Colts, and it's it's time to get back to the winning ways in the AFC South, and it's time to out-tighten the Titans. It's time to get back to the winning ways and do it at home. Yeah. To me, I think that's that's the big key for me. Play the Titans at home win the game at home, beat this team. So it is a very big game. And I think it's big for another reason as well. The following week, you play the Jaguars, another AFC South opponent. You play them on the road, but if you can win that game, you win two AFC South games, win them back-to-back, that does a lot for the Colts going forward from there. But I think it's so important just playing at home, getting the home crowd behind you, and winning here at home. Question for both of you as we wrap up. As you said, the next two games, AFC South games, it, the schedule is always here lately so front loaded yes, with yeah. division games. I mean, last year by week seven, after the Colts were swept by Tennessee, right? That second game of the season where you lost to Tennessee for the second time in mid to late October, the season yeah, was Halloween. pretty much it was it was hard to overcome that. With these next two games for both of you, I don't know if they're must win games, but what would you classify them as? Oh. Like what, fill in the blank. Next two games are what? I don't. I don't want to speak for Bill, but I know he's not a big must-win guy. <laughs> so I under. I know where Bill is going you know on this I'm one. Going. I'm more must-win than Bill. I, is, I'm so. right with Matt on this one. It it may not be must-win, but it's pretty darn close. I mean, this is a game that, and 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 I'm not looking at it from like playoffs and all of that. I think it's bigger than that. This is just you. You talked about mentality. Yeah. You. I think that it for the culture, mm-hmm. the Titans have been kind of that team over the last There's handful of years yeah. that it's like you just can't get over that hump. Yep. And I'm not saying that they're exposed this year, but what they have put on tape through four games is they're a team that's not consistent. Right. So go out there, play your style of football, regain the home field, get the fans at Lucas Oil really given something to cheer about because – the last time you won was the Alec Pierce touchdown against Jacksonville last year. That was five years Seems ago. like so long <laughs> yeah. ago. So yeah. just getting a victory inside Lucas Oil, yes, inside the AFC South for sure. Yes, is against a team in the Titans that you've been trying to beat. But I think it's just a, a culture thing. Give these young guys, give Anthony Richardson his first victory at home. Yeah. I mean, yeah. all of that is what I'm looking at. Like, yes, it's a it's a Maybe not must win, but it's pretty darn close. <laughs> I know you want nothing to do with this. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I backed uh, you in the corner. No, you didn't back me in the yeah. corner. I'm just, hey, I'm fine you're with like, it. Like, to me, to me. Mick and Rocky over there. <laughs> keep going, Rocky. Keep, 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 keep going, going Rocky. Rock. <laughs> it's over. <laughs> no, I'm sorry I did that to you. No, you didn't put me in the corner <laughs> at all. Just for me, it's not, it's not a must win because I think you guys know how I feel about must wins. A must win to me is this, hey, you have to win. Week get, 18. Yeah, you have yeah, to yeah. win and get in the playoffs, <laughs> stuff like that. If you, if that's to me is a must win, but it's an important win. I think it's an important game, I should say. It's very important for the Colts to go out there and you say, it helps establish your culture. We're playing an AFC South opponent in your home building. You need to go out there and win and play well at that. Not just win the ball game, but play well. You want to yeah. dominate. You want to be physical. Beat them at what they say is their own game. And if they can do that, I think that goes a long way. So I think it's very important, not just winning the game, but how they play yeah. against the Titans on Sunday. That's well said, man. You boxed yourself right out of that corner. <laughs> I tried my that, best. You know, I, I, I can good. duck and dodge pretty good. You know? I'm, like, <laughs> I'm like the German in Rocky IV, man, coming straight at you, double I'm trying, barrel I'm trying action. to duck and dodge those punches, that's man. really good. Anytime I can bust out the Mick impression, on that, <laughs> that's a good day right there. Here's what we know. This game is likely coming down to the wire, right? Colts and Titans in, in typical AFC South fashion. Get your heart monitors out. Oh, yeah. This yeah. team, uh, it's going to do it to you, right? The last two games in overtime, <laughs> the Titans come to town. We know what that kind of represents. So uh, get your popcorn out on Sunday, 1 o'clock, Colts and Titans at Lucas Oil Stadium. We had fun breaking it down. Bill Brooks, Casey Vallier, I'm Matt Taylor. Week number five is here, and we will talk to you in week six, Colts and Jaguars, next Thursday. Until then, have a great rest of your week. Enjoy your weekend. Go Colts, and we'll talk to you next week here on the Colts Audio Network and YouTube.